Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for the uh, very kind invitation. I'm really happy to be here tonight and uh, share uh, uh, our work uh, at Paris uh, Descartes with you guys. And uh, I also would like to thank very much Roberto, uh, who actually made a great introduction to uh, uh, this uh, talk because, uh, of course, we're going to talk about the brain. And uh, our uh, main interest is uh, learn and uh, how people understand and how people behave uh, in their professional context. So we're mentioning back here uh, medical field, but uh, everything we do can be extended to any other uh, discipline uh, or to any other professions. Uh, and one of the main questions, and I, I really like uh, the way you actually said the story of uh, uh, progression of uh, understanding on the brain. What I really like is that it shows when you take a step back, uh, it shows where we stand uh, in the comprehension of uh, um, the function of the brain. And uh, what's fascinating is that uh, we're really at the beginning and there are so many, many things to understand and to discover. Uh, and when you look at the history of uh, discovery in the medical field, uh, it really reminds me of the first steps of anatomy uh, some uh, 500 years ago where people would use to, uh, uh, words to describe what they, what they saw when dissecting uh, brains, when uh, dissecting uh, uh, corpses, etc. And we're really in that uh, very uh, first phase of description and trying to understand the function of the different parts of the brain and, uh, and linking these functions to the uh, uh, usual uh, uh, mechanisms for uh, seeing, understanding, speaking, behaving, learning, etc. And that, that's really one of the things uh, I will be uh, very interested in in the next uh, years. And, and that's for sure one of the main um, goals we're aiming at in terms of learning uh, for the next year. But getting back to, uh, to uh, uh, healthcare training and what we're interested in, uh, it's, it's really, what you have to understand is that it's really an, an era of uh, highly disruptive innovation. In the medical fields, uh, data or knowledge changes or is renewed by 50% every uh, two and a half years. So it's a high pace. Uh, uh, disruptive uh, environment, which requires a high-paced uh, training, uh, of course, to be uh, sure that any people working in this field is actually uh, have the appropriate knowledge to take care of uh, patients, etc. So we'll uh, go into that, and I'll show you how we work to uh, address these challenges of uh, having people trained in the right way, of having people being uh, professional, of having people. Uh, working uh, and taking care uh, in an expert way of uh, patients. It works back. Yes. So anyway, when you look at uh, the ways to improve uh, health care over the uh, past years, uh, there are many things that made uh, uh, knowledge and uh, uh, skills and competencies uh, progress. But nowadays, the most important aspects of aspect of uh, uh, healthcare progression are uh, technology and research. And you, this is your work, so you know about that. Uh, finding new drugs, finding new mechanisms, understanding the brain function, for example, etc. This is really one of the uh, masterpiece of the next uh, uh, progresses for healthcare. But the other thing on a very practical level also is how we use this uh, knowledge, how we apply them, and how this uh, impacts the uh, patient care. And at the, on this level, there are two other very important things. One is organization of care, how you take care of patient, and the other one is make sure that people take care of you have the appropriate information and training, which is of course very important, making sure that they use these knowledge, that these knowledge are transferred wisely, and that they are used in a, a coherent uh, organization. So we, we're very much interested in understanding how we uh, uh, could improve learning, and how we could transfer uh, knowledge, uh, new technology, new drugs, new findings into a concrete uh, a strategy for patients. Uh, and we actually worked in uh, new uh, trying to implement new environments for learning based on two things. One is new concepts in learning, which I will actually go into uh, details. And the other one, uh, which is yet to come, I guess, is the impact of neurosciences. So I will briefly mention this, 
you say that uh, so far learning has been um, addressed in a very pragmatic way, uh, but it is very likely that with uh, new data on how the brain functions, we will be able to understand what people can learn, how they can learn, uh, how much they can take, uh, uh, how much information they can take, how they build uh, new um, uh, new information on existing information within the brain, etc. And so far, for example, when you go to a class, uh, the class usually lasts one or two hours, but there's, there, there are actually no data uh, to support that one hour is better than two, and that you, if you stay two hours, then it's more likely that you actually get the information better than one, etc. So, with this respect, uh, what we expect is data on how the brain functions and how people are actually able to learn to actually um, be able to shape learnings with respect to the uh, function of the brains and not with respect to the uh, timetable of the teacher or to, organi to the organization of the day, etc. And I think this is one of the key uh, uh, things we will uh, um, be able to address for them next year. But anyway, so the next uh, uh, step is to understand new concepts uh, in healthcare training. So healthcare training is very specific because we will uh, need to be able to uh, teach medical and technical activities, sometimes very uh, uh, technical stuff. Uh, as I said, there's a fast change and renewal, uh, renewal of knowledge, which uh, means that when you enter into a healthcare profession, you will spend your whole life learning. And what you have learned when you were students will dramatically change when you will be 10 years uh, after or 20 years after, etc. So this is a highly demanding task, but it's also a very interesting task because you don't do the same thing every every uh, every time and every year, every 10 years, etc. And of course, as you understand, the uh, more technical it gets, uh, the more team uh, teamwork it includes. So we will be also interested in working uh, on how to teach uh, teamwork activities. So what you need to become a healthcare professional is actually the uh, articulation of three, three basic steps. And again, this is not uh, only linked to healthcare, but to anything that you actually learn, and especially what you do in the lab, etc. So you actually need knowledge, which is the first step, and then you need skills, competencies, and then you also need attitudes, which is behavior. And if you don't get the knowledge, it's really difficult to actually build skills and attitude. So to take an example, when you want to learn PCR, uh, you have to get the basic, the theory of PCR, and then you need to have the skills to do your experiment uh, and to run your uh, experiment properly, and then to have the uh, uh, ability to actually articulate all of this to interpret your experiment. Uh, and this is actually the same in uh, healthcare, so you need to uh, have the knowledge of certain disease if you want to take care of the, of the patient. You have to have specific skills if you want to run into a, sp a specific or a technical uh, examination. And then you have to have proper behavior or attitude if you want to communicate wisely with your patients. So these are, these are really the three basic steps that we ask uh, for a healthcare professional. And actually training each of these steps is, is quite difficult and quite different uh, if you address the knowledge, the skills, or the attitudes. So basically, knowledge delivery used to be this, and I guess uh, you won't see this anymore, and uh, we are actually using a new technology to improve this. Uh, but new technology is actually uh, supporting and only supporting new concepts in pedagogy. So what we want to do is actually achieve a number of changes. And we want the uh, learners to be independent in their own learning by promoting active form of learning, so engaging the learners. We want to use the recall of experience, and this is what's been uh, uh, described as experiential learning, uh, matching experience with new uh, information, new knowledge, etc. And also we want to uh, be very practical when we teach or when we have, when we have learners uh, uh, learning uh, medicine. So we use actually uh, objective-based learning or problem-based learning to make it more practical. And the last thing, which is one of the most important things, is a whole change of paradigm uh, uh, between uh, a few years back and, and uh, now, 
when you take students, so when you take a uh, medical student, for example, uh, people used to actually tell what is good. Uh, and now we have the ability to actually tell and show what is wrong. And this is actually a powerful tool to be able to learn from your errors. And when you take, uh, again, a step back, uh, in every uh, profession, in every story, uh, some of the important steps have been made just by analyzing errors. It, it's through science, it's through medicine, it's through innovation, for example. And these are these errors are actually some of the best uh, markers for major changes uh, in uh, in the knowledge. So we really, really uh, take advantage of that, and we actually promote doing errors, of course, in a secure way. And you will see how we do that uh, to uh, promote learning for students. So basically, if you take a, a picture, uh, these changes in paradigm would be uh, these uh, two pictures. In the uh, old system, you would have a teacher here uh, and one uh, learning tools following the teachers. The problem of this uh, model is that uh, if uh, some of the students actually don't follow carefully, they can fall or they can uh, be uh, uh, outdated. And the problem is that the teacher needs to actually adapt the pace to the slowest uh, students. Um, so you get rid of it and you actually uh, engage in a more active form of learning and you see that the teacher is not standing on the bike anymore, he's uh, uh, on his foot and each student has its own tool for learning. So each student has its own, has its own bike. This allows the different students to actually move on their own pace and, and learn on their own pace. Uh, and the teacher to actually take care of uh, some specific students without um, slowing the others in their uh, learning. So this is very important because uh, this gives more independence uh, and more autonomy to the students in their own learning. So basically, with the uh, future changes, uh, and some of them are actually available at the moment, uh, we will be able to dramatically uh, change the um, uh, formats of access to knowledge and information. So you know you're you're all aware of the virtual universities. You're all aware that the blackboard that was here uh, on the picture is actually transforming into uh, um, e-learnings or MOOCs uh, or online learning, etc. So this is really uh, dedicated to knowledge delivery. Okay. When we think of more complex cognitive level in learning. Uh, which is, uh, for example, the acquisition of skills, competencies, or behaviors, uh, then uh, we need to have other tools to be able to address these, uh, these objectives. And so basically, we're, uh, we were interested in developing new learning tools. So books, we talked about that. We're, uh, at the moment, very much uh, um, trying to implement the uh, classroom concepts. So if you're not aware with that, uh, it's basically a, a total change uh, in the uh, way you actually uh, um, uh, go into a class. Uh, and what we do is that we actually ask the students to work uh, on knowledge before they actually come to the class. And the class is only dedicated to uh, problem solving, reflection, etc. So this actually requires a careful preparation for students because the uh, uh, school system, at least in France, does not prepare all the students to that kind of format. So this is a, a quite uh, tricky change, uh, but I think we will uh, uh, move towards this uh, model uh, within, within the next uh, years. And especially in healthcare also, we're very much interested in developing simulation-based technology because this is one uh, answer to uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, things uh, I highlighted uh, earlier, the ability to learn from errors in a very secure way. So basically, instead of taking care of you when you go to the hospital, the young students uh, is actually taking care of simulated uh, patients, simulated environments, etc. So it means that if he fails running his operation, it's not going to be on you, which is uh, pretty good, but it's going to be on the mannequin, it's going to be on the computer, etc. But the learning will still be the same for him, and it, I would say it would be even more powerful because if he can make mistakes, he can analyze the mistakes, and he can understand 
why he made mistakes and what are the consequences of these mistakes. Uh, and we can uh, move these from physical environment to virtual environment, which is very uh, interesting uh, because it has the ability to actually uh, dramatically enhance the, uh, the access to that kind of uh, learning program. So basically, we're also very interested in matching learners to their own uh, generation and to their own tools. So what you see here has been long discussed, and the question of uh, is it good or bad is, is not the right one, I guess. Uh, the thing is that it's happening uh, and it's developing. So we need to adapt the tools uh, and move and switch from blackboards to virtual environment, and we'll move within the next year to immersive environment, which I will be uh, showing you later on. Uh, so basically, we have developed a number of simulation technology. The idea is actually to be able to replace patients uh, for learning by uh, simulation technology. And uh, you have different uh, examples of that. So the existing uh, examples are the uh, corpses or living bodies. And these are actually being, being used for the, over the uh, last uh, 500 years, 100 years. And these tools actually, uh, including animal testing, uh, have actually been really one of the uh, keystone for the uh, medical progress uh, over the past uh, 500 years. And now we're moving towards other uh, simulated uh, tools, and we have plastic mannequins, which are which are actually becoming more and more real and becoming more and more um, <coughs> realistic and uh, handy. And uh, we, so you can have. Parts of parts of the bodies, but you can also have really uh, full-scale uh, human bodies, adults, um, newborns, uh, babies, etc. And these mannequins, as you will see uh, in the next uh, slide, are actually able to speak, to bleed, to have cardiac arrest, to receive drugs, to be auscultated. Uh, you can take the pulse. You can uh, do a number of uh, injections, etc. So you can actually interact. When you put them in a realistic environment, as you would do for any kind of patient, uh, an adult, a baby, a, a birthing a mother, etc. And then, in addition to that, in addition to these, we have also virtual environments. So, uh, either totally virtual environments that can be operated on desktop, on uh, ta uh, tablets, or on immersive environment when you actually stand in a blank room with a video projection system that actually projects a 3D environment that moves when you move around the, the room in a very uh, realistic fashion and you can actually interact with your environment and modify your environment. Uh, so impressive. And there are also hybrid uh, solutions uh, that interfaces uh, virtual environment and physical tools. For example, for surgery, uh, you can have uh, surgery tools and uh, virtual uh, anatomy here that allows you to actually learn in a very realistic way what you could do uh, in an operating room on real patients. So basically how, how we operate this is we uh, uh, put uh, these mannequins in simulated environments and what you see here is actually the capture of a real uh, uh, simulation scenario going on in the simulation center. Uh, and you have vision of different angles, so the cameras are actually on the ceiling. Uh, and you see healthcare professional taking care of this patient. So he, you see he had a head trauma here. Uh, he's uh, most likely to be bleeding. Uh, and they're actually trying to understand what the problem is with this patient, trying to take care of him. You have his light signs here, so his heart is beating uh, 154 per minute, which is uh, quite uh, fast, and probably the blood pressure is going to uh, fall because the patient is bleeding. Uh, so it allows us actually to put people in very realistic situation with the emergency uh, uh, um, structure and understand how they uh, take care of the patient, how they work, how they understand the uh, situation, how they do take uh, uh, um, very uh, detailed care of the patient, how they auscultate, how they do uh, uh, med uh, drugs in injections, etc., how they give oxy oxygen for the patient, etc., but also how they collaborate together. Uh, and you will see within the next uh, uh, minutes how 
this has been inspired by uh, the uh, aviation industry and how we actually reproduce some of the uh, simulation and training that pilots do. So what you can see here is that we're able to have, uh, this is the ultrasound picture within the scenario, or you could have MRI or CT scan, etc. Uh, and uh, all of these people will actually take care of the patient. So what we do after that, because it's not only about uh, being in a, in a situation, we actually take some time after that, use this video tool to analyze and debrief on the situation they've been encountering and they've been taking care of. And on the very uh, open uh, discussion, we actually try to understand how they've uh, been uh, um, seeing the situation, how they've been taking care of the patient, and how they can improve uh, what they did, and uh, either on a technical level or on uh, what we call non-technical level, which is communication, group interaction, teamwork, etc. So this this is really a very uh, new and powerful tool uh, to address um, very realistic situation in medicine, and, and you can understand that these patients, if we don't do anything, is going to die within the hour. And it's not the right time if it was a real patient to actually take the time to teach students. You don't want to be losing time to uh, explain why uh, the, um, the bleeding here is uh, um, uh, life threatening, why the heart is beating fast, etc. You want to go fast and take care of the patient. So we actually take this situation from the real life to simulate an environment. And with this, we're able to actually understand with the learners how they can improve. So this can be done in very uh, different situations. This is a reproduction of an uh, operating room. So you will see surgeons taking care of a patient. And here, the anesthesia team here has problem uh, uh, having the patient uh, breathing. Uh, and here you see the evolution of the vital signs over the scenario. And uh, they are trying to operate, they are trying to give the patient oxygen and we will understand how they perform both on the technical level but also on the non-technical level and the communication between the two teams and the different persons here is really important for the efficacy of the uh, 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 work uh, around this patient. So this is another example. So we actually have a huge uh, bank of scenarios, of situations that are all inspired by real life. So it's one of you or a, a patient going to uh, the hospital, to the uh, emergency room, to the operating room, etc., uh, and uh, being taken care of by uh, by healthcare professional. So all of these scenarios can be exported on mannequins, which is uh, what you've seen. But we can also virtualize everything and export them on desktop or on, on uh, 3D uh, 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 interfaces, 3D televisions, on smartphones, on tablets, etc., or in 3D immersive uh, environments. So this is the thing I've been describing to you earlier. Uh, it's really small, so you don't see. But basically, you're in a big room, three white walls with nothing, and we, when you start the program, you have a whole virtual environment in front of you, meaning that Instead of having a, a real environment like I have in front of me, I would have the window, a virtual window. And if I go towards that virtual window, I can actually look outside the window and see what's happening uh, virtually uh, within the environment. This is really impressive. And we are actually working now on reproducing um, a healthcare environment totally virtual and being, being able to, ent to interact uh, in a totally uh, virtual way. And so far, we are able to actually have one uh, person interacting uh, within the uh, uh, environment, but the army has now training sectors where they train uh, um, their personnel to actually to um, uh, so they train the personnel to launch uh, 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 missiles, and they are actually able to have different avatars that enter this immersive environment and uh, uh, work with a whole team, a whole virtual team. This is really impressive. So we actually built uh, the uh, mirror of the physical uh, environment that you've seen on the uh, videos, and we built this uh, virtual environment. Uh, so we have a whole virtual hospital where we actually create different situations, uh, and where we're able to uh, implement 
what we call serious games. So it's actually a situation where you take care of a patient uh, in a, a gay fashion. The difference with a real game is that the, uh, uh, the goal of this uh, scenario is not your entertainment, but you learning uh, what you have to learn. So we actually create combination software with serious aspects. Uh, and there's always a scenario, a learning content, a content, a training, <coughs> etc. And you have also game derived aspect, uh, uh, which we actually take from video games. So I'll show you a few examples. But basically, this uh, technique here is called gamification. So you take a serious program, a serious scenario, and you actually take um, things from video games or uh, fun things from video games and you put them in your uh, serious scenario. So it's not just about uh, having fun or putting uh, fun stuff in a serious scenario. It's, it's really deep thinking on how video game techniques or uh, uh, video game derivative, derivative, derivative videos, sorry, can actually um, uh, enhance the uh, learning experience. And how are you going to use this to uh, engage your learner in your scenario, engage your learner in, a, in your series game, or enhance uh, what uh, he can get from this uh, program. So it's actually the combination of a useful scenario and a specific game scenario. So we have uh, uh, two platforms, two uh, virtual platforms. One is for the uh, general public, and it's uh, freely accessible on the web. Uh, I can sh uh, give you some uh, web addresses if you want to test them. So you basically enter in a, a very realistic situation where we ask you as a uh, bystander uh, in a, a cardiac arrest situation, for example, to uh, take care of uh, someone falling in the street and uh, uh, take the, uh, make the first uh, steps of uh, uh, reanimation and uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So this is actually a, a way to uh, meet a situation that can be potentially dramatic in a very secure way. And we have another uh, platform which is restricted to healthcare professionals, uh, where you actually have the ability to enter a virtual hospital and take care of a real situation, a virtual situation, with a real patient. So I'm going to show you how it looks like, and you will see that this is really, really realistic. And here we stand in a uh, uh, birthing uh, in a delivery room. So the patient here has just given birth to a nice baby and she's actually bleeding after the, uh, the, the birth. So the different uh, people here, you have a midwife, a doctor, and uh, the avatar, which uh, allows you to see as a nurse. Uh, and you will see how in this environment, the people will collaborate and have different options uh, to uh, um, make different things for this patient and uh, make sure that she doesn't die of bleeding after, uh, after delivery. So it's a video from a uh, live uh, uh, game, uh, and you have people uh, taking care of the patient in a really uh, realistic way. And of course, uh, the time is the same uh, as in real life, and of course the interaction is the same as in real life. The drugs that you can give is the same than, uh, in real life, and the consequences of what you do are exactly the same than in real life. So with this, you're able to actually take care of a patient a number of times, and, and if you don't do the right things, well, you have to start over and over and over until your patient is uh, correctly taken care of. So this is a very nice tool because with this, we're actually able to understand or to track how many times you've been uh, working with the scenario, how many uh, times you were failing, where you were failing and how you can improve. So it gives us very, uh, very um, detailed uh, data on uh, your progression, uh, your level, etc. So basically, what we want to make sure is that you uh, have a better experience than just standing in front of a book learning uh, your um, lesson. And to do so, we actually use uh, um, techniques from uh, um, video games. So one example here, and this is a cardiac arrest situation, uh, is uh, something we took from this game. Uh, maybe some of you are aware of it. It's called a Guitar Hero, and it's a game where you can actually learn the guitar. So you have a physical plastic guitar. And you, on this video game here, you have the strings of the guitar, and each time a note passes 
on one of the uh, uh, color uh, around here, you have to press the string uh, of the guitar. So this is just a tool to actually have you learn the right um, rhythm. And what we do uh, in this program uh, is that we use this to actually have the learner uh, learn the right rhythm of cardiac massage, which is one of the main feature uh, of uh, uh, resuscitation for this kind of patient. So I'm not sure I'm going to put the video here. But anyway, so if you go uh, on this website, it's called uh, stainalive.fr, well, you will enter this situation and you will see that when you're in uh, this step, here you're required to do the cardiac massage at a certain rate, which is 100 beats per minute. And each time the red part here passes in the window, the zone, the heart will pass like this, exactly like the notes here. Well, you have to press uh, and do the cardiac massage. So this actually is a better trick to help you uh, retain the right rhythm for cardiac massage. So this is one example of uh, uh, gamification. Other examples are uh, actually using the uh, leveling up concept uh, and uh, allowing you to actually uh, enter different difficulty levels once you have completed the uh, basic levels or unlocking content, uh, providing you new tools, new drugs, etc. when you have worked with the basic one. Uh, of course, you can have all of things in this kind of uh, uh, programs and uh, of course collaborative models where you uh, get connected in a situation with someone in New York, someone in Delhi, someone in whatever other city and work together on a clinical case. Oops. We're missing one here. So basically, this is what we developed uh, in our lab at uh, Paris de Chart. Uh, and um, we try to articulate all of these techniques, of the, all of these simulation techniques, uh, together to uh, make sure that every part of what we expect uh, uh, of a healthcare professional is actually addressed by a specific learning technique. And this is really important to understand that Again, we articulate knowledge, we articulate skills and behaviors, and for all of these uh, specific goals, we have different tools. Okay. Uh, so basically, if you want to take a step in the future, what we expect with these tools is uh, to be able to follow the evolution of healthcare. So healthcare tomorrow, you may have heard of uh, uh, crazy projects. Uh, uh, different evolutions, etc. But what's going to be for sure the, within the next uh, 10 years or so is that doctors will actually um, uh, be helped more and more by computer. Uh, and uh, for most of the patients, for most of the uh, uh, diagnosis, etc., the very simple uh, steps will be done by computer. So basically, when you will enter some of the symptoms uh, on the computer or when sensors will actually get uh, data from patient with some of the symptoms then very basic algorithm will be run by computers and some of the information will be given by, uh, by computers so doctors will actually uh, collaborate with this and we will need to train uh, healthcare professionals to that kind of uh, uh, exercise uh, because it, it's going to be very different from what we do at the moment the next uh, evolution also is uh, the evolution towards personalized medicine. So basically, with this uh, computer-assisted diagnosis, you will be able also to, to, to you will be able to provide specific treatments or specific um, uh, strategy for each patient. Meaning that, depending on your uh, on your history, etc., uh, for one specific disease, the treatment may not be the same. It's already the case uh, for uh, certain can cancers, uh, and depending uh, if you have breast cancers, uh, for example, depending on your hormonal status, depending on your immune status, depending on the kind of tumor, etc., you don't have the same treatment. Uh, and uh, we will move uh, towards this, and again, one of the aspects of training will be to uh, uh, make sure that this personalized medicine is actually um, uh, well understood and uh, well performed 
And for this, the simulation tool will really, really help us to, uh, to move uh, towards this. And, and lastly, I think that we will move. Whoops. Yeah. No? Okay. So lastly, we will move uh, towards um, uh, technology based uh, disease prevention, meaning that uh, some of the sensors that uh, you may be able to wear, like connected watches, connected uh, t shirts, etc., will be able to get data. Uh, from you and to uh, tell you whether you are uh, following uh, uh, good conducts or uh, prevention for certain disease and the ability to actually treat these data uh, will help us to uh, uh, make sure that patients uh, don't get exposed to certain risk or uh, uh, don't uh, have uh, 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 arising diseases uh, and again the, uh, the interpretation of these data and the handling of these data will be very important and, and for this the training will be, uh, will be uh, crucial as well. What's very important is that uh, the, all of these techniques, uh, specifically the simulation techniques, are inspired from the uh, aviation industry and uh, the aviation industry has uh, um, realized a nice challenge um, over the uh, past uh, 50 years uh, which is both the expansion of their activity, they have a growing uh, activity over the past 50 years, and the dramatic uh, reduction of uh, accidents uh, risks. Uh, and uh, if you take the uh, chances of dying in a plane in the uh, late uh, 60s and in, um, in nowadays, it has dramatically uh, decreased. And now if you take the plane, your chances of dying is approximately one per four million. So meaning that one uh, passenger dies every four million passengers transport. So last year was actually the uh, safest year in the aviation and only uh, 280 people died. Uh, in healthcare, the problem is that the statistics are quite different. And this is uh, not only linked to the uh, health status of the patients, but also to the risk associated to, uh, to care. So, if you enter the hospital, your risk of uh, dying or, ha or having a critical adverse event is not one per four million, but it's one per four hundred, and it's still very, very high. And we need to work on this. And for sure, uh, using that kind of learning techniques, using simulation tools, will dramatically help us to, uh, to decrease this. This is not only a lot, uh, associated with ethical problems because you want to make sure that your patient are treated. Uh, uh, in the best way you can and have no uh, specific risk uh, associated to care, but it is also linked to a higher cost for healthcare. So, if you monitor in France some of the most frequent uh, adverse events uh, associated to healthcare, um, the uh, uh, direct cost for that for the society is approximately one, um, uh, uh, 800, sorry, 800 billion euros uh, per year. So if you think of the economy that we could do uh, with improving uh, um, uh, healthcare through simulation, there's a whole margin of, uh, of progress. So anyway, of course, the new challenges uh, and uh, interfaces uh, will uh, arise. Of course, the, the question of the cost of these techniques is very important. But again, if you think that these techniques will help us to uh, solve some of the uh, quality and security of care problems, then it's worth the investment. Uh, the question of the availability and dissemination of the, these tools, having a mannequin uh, working in a simulated environment is not that easy. Uh, but again, working with serious games, working with virtual environment is uh, totally, uh, totally uh, doable uh, and available on any, on any computer. And, and the, the last question, which we uh, can discuss, of course, is the scientific evaluation of all of this. And we're trying to get more and more uh, research uh, and research experiments on understanding how the um, students can actually gain from these uh, initiatives. Um, I'm going to skip on this. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, all right. the uh, aviation uh, statistics. And just to conclude, yeah. So we've associated what we call the concept of blended learning. Uh, it's the association of different techniques, different modalities for learning, uh, for both initial training 
for uh, continuous training. As I said, a healthcare professional will learn uh, for all his life. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, virtual environments and research. So here you see again the mannequins, different mannequins. These are the uh, simulated environments uh, in the virtual interfaces, another uh, uh, virtual interfaces, and a research program that we can do on, uh, on learning. Anyway, a few perspectives based on this. So we need to understand the impact of new concepts uh, in learning. We need to actually integrate also the lessons uh, that I mentioned from neurosciences, how the brain functions, how we can improve uh, the learning, how we uh, deliver the uh, learning to make sure that the learners uh, actually get the right um, uh, pace and the right uh, amount of data and can integrate and optimally integrate uh, everything. And uh, of course we're trying to move towards more real life based training, being able to train in different environments than in real life. And of course this totally change uh, the way we take care of the patient, and this will allow to accompany the changes in the uh, future of healthcare and develop new trainings. And I think, yeah, just playing uh, like that in the future. Thank you.